Beijing brings back coronavirus restrictions as the Chinese capital reports over 100 new infections in five days. Chinese and African leaders team up for a virtual summit on fighting COVID-19. And dozens of government troops reported dead or missing following an attack in northwest Mali. Hello and welcome. You're watching Africa Live. We're coming to you live from Nairobi. I'm Hannah Vivier. Here more stories making headlines this hour. In business news, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa sets up a new council to help revive state-owned entities. And in your sport, South Africa sprint star Wade Fanikarik reveals the genesis of intense rivalry with Botswana's Isaac Makwala. We begin the hour in Beijing, where another 27 coronavirus cases have been reported. This brings total infections to more than 100 over the past five days. The capital is conducting extensive screening and its daily testing capacity has reached over 90,000. People who visited Shinfandi Wholesale Market, linked to a majority of the cases, must quarantine for two weeks. To curb the spread, all outbound taxi and car hailing services have been suspended and outbound travel is banned for high-risk people. Those who have left Beijing are asked to report to local authorities. Beijing's Education Authority has also ordered some schools to close and students can opt for stay-at-home classes. Our reporter, Ma Kei, attended a briefing by authorities. The deputy district head of the Sichuan district regarding the closing of seven residential compounds in the district after one confirmed cases was found related to the Xinfati wholesale market. While well, he introduced the detailed uh, precautions uh, regarding the personnel scrutiny as well as house quarantine, uh, but what's worth mentioning is that the agriculture market in question uh, has been drawn uh, environmental samples as well as human samples, and the environmental samples have all tested, uh, some of the environmental samples have tested positive of the coronavirus, but luckily all the human samples have tested uh, negative. Uh, that's the Sichuan district, one of the affected er areas in Beijing of the COVID new, newly added COVID-19 cases. Today we have also heard about the food safety from Beijing's commerce authorities who said that uh, the disinfection work on the catering businesses, uh, the agricultural markets, convenience stores, large supermarket chains are in progress and they are uh, expected to be concluded today. So far they have shut down 11 underground and sub-underground agricultural markets for failing uh, safety standards and uh, over, uh, over 40,000 volunteers uh, plus uh, police officers are on their way to do the disinfection work. And also the Commerce Authority say keeping the prices steady for fresh vegetables, fresh meat and fresh fruits are also a task for the next stage of work. Chinese President Xi Jinping will preside over an extraordinary China-Africa Solidarity Summit against COVID-19 on Wednesday. The meeting to be held via video link will be attended by heads of state, including African Union member states, UN Secretary, the UN Secretary General and the World Health Organization Director General will also attend as special guests. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, China-Africa relations have witnessed new development. At present, the global situation is still severe and the situation in Africa is also developing. At this critical moment, this summit shows the brotherhood between China and Africa. It will promote common understanding on combating the coronavirus. The summit will also promote China-Africa cooperation. This will enhance multilateralism and strengthen international cooperation in fighting the pandemic. Meanwhile, a 20-member Chinese medical team has just completed a one-month mission to Algeria and Sudan to help combat COVID-19. During their stay in Africa, the doctors and medics visited local patients and shared their treatment experience with frontline doctors in both countries. CDTN's Hei Weiwei has more. Frontline medical contacts between China and Africa. 
In Algeria, when Chinese doctors first entered isolation wards at a major hospital for COVID-19, they were greeted warmly by local patients. Hello. 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 The facilities are good, the wards are equipped with necessary devices for COVID-19 patients. The staffing is sufficient and they're taking good care of the patients. It is a great pleasure for us to share our experiences. China is a step ahead, witnessing the early cases of COVID-19. So its experience allows us to understand and predict the future state of our patients. And in Sudan, which has reported the highest number of COVID-19 cases in Eastern Africa, Chinese experts have entered the ICU. Um, for now, we have six patients six, already. Six patients, okay. So this is patient right now, this already ventilated. Oh, okay. He's been Thank here you. for around uh, four days already. Yeah, already incubated. Ready incubating. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's very severe. It's very severe. It's very severe. This is the New East and the largest hospital in Sudan. It started its operations since May, and it has a capacity of 480 beds. And now this hospital is designated for receiving the COVID-19 patients. Currently, there are a total of over 70 patients living in this hospital, living in the wards right behind me. Most of those patients in this hospital have mild or moderate symptoms. Heart rate, uh, heart rate. Yes, 129, it's too high. So how about this patient? Is it first? First? Okay. Uh -huh. that, that's okay, right? That's okay. But only for that. The Chinese team visited seven hospitals in Sudan, providing suggestions on treatment. We showed them the, our capacity of the isolation centers and we showed them our little experience during these last three months. And we'll also do more uh, presentations and video conferences with the, your experts there in China. After our visit, we'd like to take one or two samples for an in-depth case study. We will also discuss the cases remotely with other experts in China if necessary. So far, China has sent over 20 medical teams overseas to help combat the coronavirus, seven of them to African countries. He Weiwei, CGTN. In Africa, there are close to 252,000 coronavirus cases recorded with more than 114,000 recoveries. According to the Africa Centers for Disease Control, more than 6,700 people have died from the virus across the continent. Let's have a look at the cases by region. In the northern part of the continent, there are over 69,000 recorded cases of COVID-19. Egypt, Algeria and Morocco are the countries with a high number of infections. In Cairo, the virus has also spread to a few prisons in the country. Three inmates have died in Torah prison. Meanwhile, Morocco donated a first batch of medical supplies to 15 African countries to help combat the coronavirus. The supplies included face masks, hygiene caps and liters of hydroalcoholic gel. Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Senegal, Tanzania and Zambia are some of the countries receiving the aid. In West Africa, coronavirus cases have reached 52,000. Ghana and Nigeria have surpassed the 10,000 mark each. Resident doctors in public hospitals in Nigeria went on strike on Monday to demand better benefits as they battle the coronavirus. Those treating COVID-19 patients will, however, continue working, but unions have given the government two weeks to meet their demands. Medical professionals also say they have inadequate protective equipment to treat COVID-19 patients. At least 10 doctors have died in Nigeria so far from the respiratory disease. 
Meanwhile, there are over 27,000 infections in the East Africa region. The pilot phase of a regional COVID-19 surveillance system for trucks and their crew began on Monday. The new system is considered to be another valuable tool to help mitigate the disruption of domestic and regional supply of goods. The system will share truck drivers' health information into a system accessed by six EAC countries. The system will be interlinked to EAC ministries of health and accredited laboratories for accurate information. Elsewhere in Central Africa, there are over 25,000 infections reported. Cameroon has recorded over 8,000 cases and significant community transmission. The African Development Bank has responded swiftly to the needs of its member countries during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. The bank has approved a package of $13.5 million for the Central Africa region. The fund will go towards the provision of personal protective equipment, testing kits, and strengthening health care and lab facilities. And finally, in the southern region, there are over 77,000 cases of coronavirus. A decisive lockdown has been effective in stemming the spread of COVID-19 in the region. But the spread of the virus has not been curtailed in South Africa. The country is recording a daily increase in infections in the provinces of Gauteng and the Eastern Cape. The reopening of schools has also led to 98, 98 teachers and 1,800 students contracting COVID-19. Schools will be disinfected in the Western Cape province this week. Let's give you some more details on that story we had for you earlier when Nigerian doctors have started a nationwide strike. This began on Monday. Some of the things the medics are protesting against are poor welfare and inadequate supply of personal protective equipment during this coronavirus pandemic. CDTN's Kelechi and Mekalam have more details. There is no way we will continue to walk in the face of hazard and even in the face of death and we will not have life insurance cover. Resident doctors in Nigeria making good their threats to commence an indefinite strike. The strike follows the expiry of a 14-day ultimatum they had issued to authorities. The government and the medical union failed to agree on improved welfare terms for health workers. Our demands are basic demands that borders on the health, on the well-being and the abilities of doctors to offer care to Nigerians. As you are aware, the Nigerian doctors practicing at the moment are not having life insurance. What that means is that when a doctor dies, that's the end of it for his family. We are also demanding that personal protective equipment be made abundantly available in our hospitals so that we have a reduced chance of getting infected. The National Association of Resident Doctors represents about 40% of doctors in Nigeria. With rising numbers of COVID-19 cases and deaths, many fear the strike action could hamper the nation's capacity to tackle the pandemic. But the union is making an exemption for medics treating COVID-19 patients. We have exempted the isolation and treatment center. At the end of the two weeks grace we have given for the isolation and treatment center, we shall be co-opting our members from the isolation and treatment center to join the strike and it shall continue till when the government feels it's necessary to address our concerns. So far, 10 doctors have died of COVID-19. 227 others have been infected and over 800 health workers are under a watch list of possible infections. Health worker strikes aren't uncommon in Nigeria where the health sector has remained underfunded. Many medics have left the country for greener pastures there are rising concerns that this trend could further weaken the already fragile health sector. Kilichi Emekalam, CGT and Abuja, Nigeria. When the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic and Kenya reported its first case, many Kenyan couples grappled with a dilemma over whether to cancel their planned weddings. And while some did, a section chose to carry on while observing Ministry of Health guidelines. CDTN's Wilke Sanyawa brings us the story of a Kenyan wedding in the middle of a pandemic. Nothing could dampen this bride's joy, not even the masks her parents had to don to walk her down the aisle. 
Despite the pandemic, Juliet and Moses were determined to get married. But instead of the many friends they had envisioned, only a few people were in attendance at the venue, a hotel in Nairobi. Some of their friends watched the ceremony that was streamed on their social media pages. This is a fourth wedding that Brenda Mulama, a wedding photographer, has covered since Kenya reported its first case of COVID-19 in mid-March. At first, she was reluctant. Honestly, at the beginning, there was moral panic, and I'm one of those people who was really scared. I have children at home, I have a husband at home, I have family. So I was really worried I could go out there and get the virus and bring it at home. I had to go through um, the steps with the clients to ensure they really understand uh, the, what is going on, uh, to know what they'll be doing. Uh, will they be observing all the guidelines to ensure we are not spreading the virus? A number of couples in the country have chosen to get married even in the midst of the pandemic. Weddings in a time of COVID-19 are quite different from those that take place in normal times. All attendees, service providers included, have to abide by strict rules pertaining to hygiene and social distance. I had to have my mask. I had to have the right lenses for the social distancing. I couldn't go maybe with a 50 mm that I have to be at close range. I had to think about sanitizing the hands before doing my work. And other than being a photographer, I had to remind everyone to observe the MOH guidelines. In May, Kenya's Office of the Attorney General suspended marriage services after many Kenyans flocked to the office, overwhelming it as they applied for wedding permits and raising fears of the spread of COVID-19. However, Juliet and Moses, who had already made their plans, were able to carry on with their ceremony. We had made that decision we want to get married, and uh, that's the most important thing. What do we need to get married? We need the two of us, we need the officiating pastor, we need witnesses and our parents. The essential. And, and that's it. We've been able to, you know, you know work, uh, focus on the most important things and, and we are so grateful for that. Other than moving on with life, it is spreading hope, you know. Despite the pandemic, there is living, you know, there is that emotional connection. We are more than... We are more than that. We are more than the pandemic. They took their vows, promising to stay together for better or for worse. And then the happy couple sealed their union with a kiss. Because of the curfew, there would be no dancing late into the night. Instead, the two went off to face a pandemic together. Wilkisanyabwa CGTN. A truly really beautiful story to see at this time. Well, the World Health Organization is warning that countries globally must stay alert to the possibility of a resurgence of COVID-19 cases. It says for the past two weeks, more than 100,000 cases have been reported every day. This is compared to the initial 100,000 infections that were recorded within two months. 75% of the recent cases are said to be coming from 10 countries, mainly the Americas and South Asia. However, an increasing number is also being reported in Africa, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and the Middle East. The WHO insists that while fighting the coronavirus pandemic, other public health issues must be prioritized, such as influenza. This is in order to avoid the co-circulation of diseases and, as a result, overwhelming health systems. Despite the ongoing global response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we cannot lose sight of other significant public health issues, including influenza. Influenza affects every country every year and takes its own deadly toll. As we enter the Southern Hemisphere influenza season and begin planning for the Northern Hemisphere season, we must ensure that influenza remains a top priority. Co-circulation of COVID-19 and influenza can worsen the impact on healthcare systems that are already overwhelmed. As countries have fought COVID-19, a lot of the resources that are within the flu network have been not inappropriately, but entirely appropriately pushed into COVID surveillance. We now need to find that balance to ensure that we're also able to track influenza properly during that same period. Well, it's time now for us to take a short break and return more news making headlines, including. 
Dozens of government troops reported dead or missing following an attack in northwest Mali. And Sudan war crime suspect Ali Abd al-Rahman denies charges against him at the International Criminal Court. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there. To see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you. All around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Due to its geographical location, Cape Verde has become a perfect location in recent years for cocaine cartels. As a hip-hop artist and former drug addict, Gada Lomba uses his music for social criticism and awareness around real issues affecting the country. Cocaine is not the same as the minister of the world. I'm not the same as the minister of the world. I'm not the same as the minister of the world. I'm not the same as the minister of the world. Sancho uma gada lomba para palco, pessoal, obrigado. Gada lomba! Welcome back. You're watching News Making Headlines right here on Africa Live. We go to Mali now where a search is underway to determine the fate of soldiers who have been listed as missing. This is after their convoy was ambushed over the weekend at Bukawere near the Mauritanian border. Only 20 of the 64 troops who had been in the convoy were present at roll call. The unaccounted soldiers have been reported missing. The military has blamed jihadists for the assault. An Islamist insurgency, mainly led by groups linked to Al-Qaeda or ISIL, have claimed thousands of military and civilian lives and forced hundreds of thousands from their homes. A Sudanese war crime suspect has denied charges mentioned on his arrest warrant. Ali Abd al-Rahman was appearing for the first time at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. He had previously been identified in court documents as Ali Kushayb. He handed himself over to UN troops in Central African Republic last week and was sent to the ICC. He is accused of persecution, murder and rape in the western Sudanese region of Darfur between 2003 and 2004. The conflict in Darfur killed an estimated 200,000 people and left millions displaced. The United States says killings there amounted to genocide. The ICC has not accused Abd al-Rahman of that crime. His next hearing is on December the 7th, later on this year. I would kindly ask uh, Mr. Abdraman to uh, uh, whether he has been informed of the crimes he is alleged to have committed. Please. Yes, I was informed of that, but this is untrue. They made me come here following this, and I hope that I will face justice. Sudanese authorities have found a mass grave believed to contain the bodies of dozens of student conscripts. They're believed to have been shot or beaten to death in 1998. The conscripts had tried to escape the Isle of Fun military camp southeast of the capital Khartoum. That's after their commanders refused to allow them to go home to celebrate a major Muslim holiday. Sudan's top prosecutor, Taj al sir al khabir says his office was launched has launched an investigation and that some suspects who were from the government of, a, of Omar al-Bashir have fled the country. The mass grave was found and many witnesses were interrogated. The procedures were complex. The investigations and interrogations are done by a committee that includes the public prosecutor and led by a senior prosecutor 
and consists of lawyers known with professionalism in criminal cases. Nigerians fleeing violence have been allowed to seek protection in Niger despite border closures due to COVID-19. More than 30,000 Nigerians have fled to Maradi region in Niger in the few months. That's according to the UN Agency for Refugees. It allows an upsurge of attacks by armed groups in northwest Nigeria. Nigerians refugees settling in Niger's region of Maradi have been sharing their ordeal. They speak of extreme violence unleashed against civilians back in their homes. They came and started killing people. It went on until the sunset prayer. People are fleeing in all directions. We still don't know what happened to some of the villagers. Labor was triggered by running away, stress and fear. The suffering was too much and my sister did not survive. When I found her, the child was moving, but my sister was already dead. Hapsu managed to carry the newborn all the way to Niger, but that baby died a few days later. The UNHCR said the new arrivals are in urgent need of water, food and access to health services as well as shelter. In the border villages, the host villages, we could not ensure the protection of these people. The management of protection cases, the follow-up of children, the follow-up of women, all the aspects of protection, it was really very difficult. Here, in the villages of Opportunity, it will be really very easy with all the partners who are already working on the sites. The latest influx has taken the number of people fleeing Sokoto, Zamfara and Katsina states of Nigeria into Niger to 70,000. That's according to the UNHCR. As a result of the cross-border insecurity, an additional 23,000 Nigerian nationals are also now displaced in their own country. Chom Hono, CGTN. In South Africa, the presence of colonial-era statues continues to cast a dark shadow over the country that's still struggling to deal with race-related issues. Among the most prominent statues are those of Cecil Rhodes, a colonial figure known for his advocacy for greater imperial British rule in Africa. In 2015, widespread student demonstrations at the University of Cape Town led to the removal of his statue from the campus. Five years later, has anything changed there? CGTN's Travis Andrews has that report. Cecil Rhodes, a colonial era politician who was one of the epitomes of South Africa's racialized past. And here in Cape Town, the Rhodes Memorial still stands as a reminder of the impact colonialism has brought to these shores. A statue of Cecil Rhodes also once adorned the University of Cape Town campus. But that's at least until students formed the Rhodes Must Fall movement, which called for the removal of his statue. That particular special meeting the UCT Council in April of that year did vote in favor of removing uh, the statue. Uh, what then that meant was that it concluded, at least at that point in time, a month-long series of uh, activities and developments on campus and engagements, of course, where there were debates around statues and symbols. Statues of Cecil Rhodes particularly spark a variety of emotions for different people, thanks to his historical views on race. Rhodes had in fact been bragging that he was so badly underpaying and exploiting the African migrant workers in his diamond mines in Kimberley that he would use the money he had not paid them as wages to endow the university of the future, which he described in very racist terms. But even with the melting pot of cultures, there are still some roads that bear the names of figures associated with the colonial era. But change is taking place, and prominent political figures such as the late President Nelson Mandela are being immortalized through statues in the city, and old ones associated with oppression are falling. Very slowly, there have been around the country statues mostly of Favort that have been taken down and they've been sent to one of two destinations. Either they've been donated to Orania, this little um, Afrikaner only uh, town and, and farm on the Orange River banks, or else they've been donated to the Futrika Monument, which has a basement where all these fallen statues are being kept. 
for now, there's a growing call for more and more of these statues to see out their days in museums rather than streets, where proper historical context can be given and where remembrance and educational value can be extracted. For many people here, yeah, the impact of colonial era statues only enters a social discourse when events of race come to the fore, such as the Black Lives Matter movement. But these figures don't reflect the society of today. It only acts as a reminder of the long journey and sacrifices many have made to make South Africa what it is today, a country that continues to work towards social cohesion and non-racialism. Travis Andrews, CGTN, Cape Town. We go to the U.S. now, where protests against racism and police brutality have entered their 20th day. It comes after another African-American man was shot by an officer, flaring tensions across the country. Nathan King reports from the White House. Another encounter with police that should not have ended in the death of a black man, this time in Atlanta, Georgia. 27-year-old Rashad Brooks shot in the back twice after attempting to flee. His family held a deeply emotional press conference. There's no justice that can ever make me feel happy about what's been done. I can never get my husband back. I can never get my best friend. I can never tell my daughter, oh, he's coming to take you skating. Life shouldn't be where we have to feel some type of way if we see a police or somebody of a different color. But if you ask how old this young black man was, Look at your children when you see them laugh. That innocence, that joy, that pureness of soul. And you had a glimpse of what we lost. Protests have spread across Atlanta and the state of Georgia. Authorities say they could decide whether to bring charges against the officers involved by Wednesday. Meanwhile, U.S. President Trump says he will sign an executive order on policing on Tuesday. It's not expected to meet the demands of protesters and other politicians calling for wholesale reform of police forces across the United States. The U.S. president, meanwhile, has created controversy as he schedules new rallies. His first for months will be held in Tulsa. Those economies will open up much quicker than others. Nathan King, CGTN, at the White House. The business news is coming up after the break. Here's what you can expect. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa sets up a new council tasked with reviving state-owned entities. And Kenya Safaricom Digifarm offers farmers support to boost yield and access markets. Welcome back. It's time now for your business news. There have been mixed reactions to the formation of a new council tasked with fixing South Africa's ailing state-owned entities. The state owns over 700 different businesses, but many are poorly man managed and running at a loss. President Sir Ramaphosa set up the council to help return many of these entities back to health and profitability. CGTN's Sumitra Naidu reports. Ten members from business and government circles have been appointed to the Presidential State-Owned Enterprises Council. They've been tasked with implementing turnaround strategies and addressing immediate liquidity challenges. A lot of the people on the council I have a lot of respect for. Uh, there are many ex-Treasury people, uh, economists from the private sector, uh, business people. Uh, I think they have a good chance of looking at the a bigger picture and finding out what the 740 firms that South African government and municipalities own have to do to change course because South Africa's taxpayers can no longer afford this. The council has good credentials but some analysts are questioning whether it will have any teeth. The council must be put in a position to take decisions and such decisions must be implemented. If not, this council will become another talking shop. 
we clearly need a more structured system of control over state-owned enterprises. It does not seem to me that the Department of State-Owned Enterprises is really in a position to uh, exercise such oversight. In February, Finance Minister Tito Mboweni said there would be no more funding for state-owned entities, SAA in particular. His predecessor, Praveen Gordon, attempted to cut funding to the airline too, but didn't. Former Finance Minister Ntlantla Nene was fired, apparently because he too wanted to let go of these money-draining entities. It has lost a lot of money through state guarantees to keep the airways operational. And indeed, there's also an opportunity cost where these companies operated at a higher cost base. It means they were not in a position to pay the government any dividends. We look at ESCOM, which has huge losses, is having to fight for its life at the moment. There's the null, they can't pay their staff properly. They haven't paid pensions and taxes over to the government for a while. So this council was created to look at the whole picture. State-owned entities are critically important to transformation, equality and creating access to the poor. The ailing ones have had the complete opposite consequence for South Africans. Many are putting their hopes on this council to turn those entities around. Others believe all this is just a waste of time and money. Sumitra Nadu, CGT in Johannesburg, South Africa. Kenya's biggest telecoms operator, Safaricom, whose fuel has been fueled by its dominance of the mobile financial services market, is hoping a venture into agriculture will be its next big win. As CGTN's Mohammed Abu Bakr explains, Digifarm could be the safe haven farmers have been in need of. Kenyan farmers situated in the Rift Valley town of Bomet are celebrating their most bountiful harvest yet, thanks to Digifarm. This is the latest innovation by Kenya's biggest telecoms operator, Safaricom. It allows farmers to receive loans to buy seeds, pesticides and fertilizer. They, Safaricom Digifarm, have really helped us. They give us maize seeds and fertilizer that we have utilized and our maize grew. We had not planted or harvested any maize here for the last six years. So when they came and gave us seeds and followed up with training on how to farm better, we have benefited from it and we're proud of this program. Under this program, farmers are granted $100 of credit per acre of maize. This is then repaid with 15% interest once the crop is sold. Once the maize is collected, Digifarm organizes for a buyer who pays 31 US cents per kilogram of maize, up from 28 US cents offered by traditional brokers. Digifarm was the idea is to take the small scale farmer out of the cycle of poverty by buying, you know, allowing or, or, or providing a way in which small scale farmers could borrow money, buy high quality input, help farmers manage the growth period, and then buy the crop at the end and so that the farmer could get good price for their crop and repay the loan and then go through another cycle where they'd get more money, etc., etc. The farmer benefits a lot because this one reports better than, un unlike manual, where I could write down and then I take the papers to the office. This paperwork involves a lot of work. So with this one, as I aggregate here, all the information goes there and then the farmers are paid within seven hours. Despite concerns looming over climate change, Digifarm offers farmers insurance against weather disasters. About 1,000 farmers enrolled with Digifarm are getting payouts after floods destroyed their crops. With farming accounting for a third of the country's annual economic output, Digifarm could be the haven that farmers have been seeking in recent years. Mohamed Abubakar, CGTN. A U.S.-based Congolese designer, Anifam Mwembe, debuted her latest collection through 3D renderings on Instagram Live recently. It was a groundbreaking display of what is possible in the fashion world's new normal. She is not alone. Major brands have had to cancel shows because of the pandemic, and that spurred designers to look for innovative ways to display their latest creations. CGTN's Alexandria Majala tells us more. One of the world's most iconic fashion stages was set to be Anifam Vwemba's debut in the elite world of trendsetters. But thanks to the coronavirus pandemic, the New York Fashion Week was cancelled. Vwemba's cancelled shows sparked her creativity. 
The 29-year-old designer held a virtual show in May for her latest collection called Pink Label Congo. Her 3D animated event was watched by tens of thousands of people who streamed it on her Hanifa Instagram live page. The entire world is home on their phones. This is like the best time to do this. Like this is the best time. So we're like, I gather my team. I'm like, look guys, this is our timeline. I know it's really short, but we have to get this done because at the same time we see um, with the... COVID situation, some places are slowly easing their restrictions and people are able to come outside. I said, everyone is home, everyone's on their phones, let's get this done, let's put this show out, and let's just do it. The fashion industry has been hit hard by coronavirus lockdowns, and designers have gone virtual or adapted in other ways to meet restrictions put in place to contain the pandemic. The U.S.-based Congolese designer said she was using 3D animation months before the pandemic to design her pieces and to do remote photo shoots. But the virtual show required more work, including transforming each garment into a 3D image and using the body of an avatar to tailor the item with precise measurements. It was hard because we had to make sure that it matched the like realistic garment like we had a really hard time making sure like a dress flowed like naturally and how it would flow if a, a, a curvy woman was wearing it we had to make sure that it fit everything the right way we had to make sure that um the colors look good we had to make sure that the prints looked good um so that part was really stressful but um i mean we were working up until the last second mm -hmm. of like before the show was um presented to the world Mvomba's collection was inspired by the clothes that women wore in her native country. She's using her fashion line to raise awareness of child labor within the Democratic Republic of Congo's culture and mining industry. Mvomba plans to do more 3D shows, but would still like to see her designs showcased on a real runway someday soon. Alexandria Majala for CGTN. The Chinese Premier took part in the opening ceremony of Southern China's Canton Fair. He did so from Beijing, however, as it's an online event this year due to the coronavirus. Li Zhejiang said the fair showed China's determination to further open its economy and to maintain the global supply chain. Despite the new format, the event attracted about 25,000 enterprises as well as hundreds of thousands of buyers from around the world. Organizers say they hope it can be a major boost for global trade at this difficult time. China's oldest and largest trade fair is bracing for a new form of cloud exhibition that comes as part of the country's effort to help stabilize global supply and industrial chains amid the uncertainties caused by the ongoing pandemic. Lily Liu has more on the tech-savvy event. Guo Zhijing has been busy coaching exhibitors on how to take advantage of the cloud Canton Fair. Guo is a Tencent product manager and finds herself amazed by how real the online fair could become. The online private meeting rooms are very much like talking face to face. And if exhibitors can master live streaming functions, which allows virtual tours of factories and offices and viewing products in detail, exhibitors can actually do more than in an on site booth. Nearly 26,000 Chinese businesses are virtually offering over 1.8 million products from their showrooms and factories instead of from booths at a full-scale physical event. The fair has rolled out a 24-hour live streaming platform with the help of Chinese tech giant Tencent. Foreign buyers can register through the platform and start online negotiations at any time. They also can schedule appointments in advance to mitigate the effect of time differences. Communications can be conveyed in a variety of ways, including online conferences, video, voice, text, and graphics. Some vendors are even offering customers the chance to view their products with virtual and augmented reality. The fair now has become a 24-7 event, and our clients are from across the world. In this sense, this fair is an upgrade. In the future, online merge offline will be the trend of the exhibition industry. 
China hopes to support exporters in selling their goods and expand imports to promote the quality development of foreign trade. And China's prowess in cloud computing and other advanced solutions helps to showcase innovative methods of cooperation for Chinese and foreign companies through this online fair. More importantly, it can inspire confidence to seek opportunities amid challenging times. Lili Lu, CGTN. The lawyers of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou are accusing the U.S. and bank HSBC of providing false and incomplete evidence in her extradition case. A memo was submitted to a Canadian court which ruled last month that the case regarding her extradition to the U.S. could go ahead. In this memo, Meng's lawyers raised several key points accusing HSBC of helping the U.S. government build a case against her. So far, the only evidence that U.S. prosecutors used to accuse Moon of bank fraud is a PowerPoint file provided by HSBC. The file has been playing a central role in building a case against Moon as the U.S. accused the company of violating U.S. sanctions on Iran. For instance, the U.S. accused Huawei of using Skycom as its unofficial subsidiary to conceal its operations in Iran and violating relevant sanctions. But two really important pieces of information in that PowerPoint went missing. The first, Skycom was Huawei's business partner in Iran. And second, Huawei conducts normal business activity in Iran and provides civilian telecommunication solutions. Meng's lawyers claim both pieces of information were clearly delivered by Meng to an HSBC banker in Hong Kong in 2013. But later, such information was taken out when they were presented as the evidence against Meng. Now the questions are, how did they go missing? Was it a deliberate omission by HSBC, or was the bank under pressure to do so? Now, Moon's lawyer is saying that HSBC knew about Skycom's business in Iran from the beginning, and it also understood Skycom's relationship with Huawei, and they will provide evidence to support these claims. In the next proceeding on June 23rd, the court will hear evidence and arguments from both prosecutors and Moon's lawyers and the points made by this memo are expected to be the focal point of debate. So we out CGTN, Beijing. It's time for us to take a short break and return your sport news. South Africa sprint star Wade Fanny Carrick reveals the genesis of intense rivalry with Botswana's Isaac Makwala. How would you create your legend on the fields on the tracks in the arenas of Africa were you born to be a player could this moment be yours sports scene fine Time now for your sport news. A South African sprint star Wade Fanny Carrick has said that his breakthrough performance in the Paris Diamond League in 2015 kick-started a long-standing battle with Botswana's Isaac Makwala to be crowned King of Africa in the men 400 meters. Fanny Carrick, then 22, stunned the world with an African 400 meter record of 43.96 seconds in July 2015, only to wake up the next day to find that Makwala had already broken it. As Olympic champion and world record holder, Fanny Carrick is now arguably the king of the 400 meters, even if his last few seasons have been blighted by injury as he seeks to return to competition after a three-year battle with his body. It was, it was like bittersweet because I, I broke the record and it was so cool. And obviously, it was like my first massive trend internationally. It was the first time I, I, I got that experience of being a pro champ if i could put it that way like you do run races people do see you people do know you do people do acknowledge you and so on but that was the first time i felt like a champion i felt like i won a, a medal or something and then the bitter part was i woke up the next morning and i saw it was broken 
in Tanzania, record champions Yanga SC edged Mwadui FC 1-0 at Kambarad Stadium in Shinyanga. It was the country's first mainland Premier League match as football resumed since March when action was suspended due to COVID-19. CDTN's Isaac Lukanda has more. Yanga has made a good start to the Premier League after its resumption. Three friendly matches a week before came in handy in its match against Mwadui FC. They are now third on the table with 54 points, 18 behind Simba Sports Club, who currently top the league table. Fans feel that the quality of football shown on the pitch makes them the best club in the country. You know, Simba and Yanga are rivals. We could play the best football, but Simba can dismiss it, and they can play the best football, and I would do the same because we don't wish each other well. But the best team is known. It's Yanga. Having set a goal of achieving maximum points in its remaining matches, Yanga now wants to win an away match against JKT on the 17th of June. While Yanga may not be able to close the point gap with Simba, this sports analyst believes Yanga's continued success on the pitch may have long-term benefits. Their win was very meaningful. The only remaining title to be taken is the Azam Sports Federation title. It gives Yanga an opportunity to take part in international competitions next season. While football fans in Dar es Salaam believe league-topping Simba Soccer Club will win the league trophy, there is still debate on which is the best club in Tanzania. What all fans can agree on is that they are happy that football leagues have resumed. Having dominated for most of the season, Simba fans feel there is no debate on who the best team in the country is. For them, lifting the league trophy seems almost certain. Fans of the club see the remaining matches as a mere formality. If you look at our players, fans, and Simba's name, it still has what it takes to win and become Premier League champions in Tanzania. With social distancing, face masks, and hand washing a requirement to attend matches, the end of restrictions on sporting activities has brought a new reality to Tanzanian football. We are told that fans must observe social distancing. This is a very new thing in football, but because the COVID-19 pandemic has changed our lives, we have no choice but to get used to this. Three months without league matches doesn't appear to have dampened fans' enthusiasm for the sport. They eagerly follow each match, awaiting the crowning of the league champions in the near future. Isaac Lukando, CGTN, Dar es Salaam. In international football, the English Premier League resumes on Wednesday with Aston Villa taking on Sheffield United, followed a few hours later by Manchester City hosting Arsenal. All eyes will be on Villa Park, where both teams plan 